One of my favorite franchises from when I was a kid was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. My story with them isn't the typical story that you hear a lot when people bring up the Ninja Turtles. I was not born when the Ninja Turtles were in their prime, far from it. Being born in 2002, I wasn't even able to grow up with the 2003 series, which a lot of people have nostalgia for as well. I was one of the odd ducks that grew up with the 2012 show, that's right, I am young. It was a really cool time to be a Ninja Turtles fan in my opinion. The show did really well, both critically and in ratings. I remember me and my friends being obsessed with that show. The franchise seemed to be getting more and more popular, there were toys every and not just that, but there was a new movie series that was getting started. Those were none other than the rebooted Michael Bay Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies. Now these things are infamous. Before the Sonic movie controversy, there was this. Oh, you nasty ass bastard! You these films are known for being a large deviation from its source material, not only in the design of the turtles, but their backstory, multiple different characters, its tone, everything was different from past series, and even the movies that came beforehand. All of this started from announcement to when the trailers dropped when the movie came out itself. There was a lot of drama and controversy around this film before its release, unlike anything I saw at the time. You gotta remember, this was 2013-2014. Stuff like that aforementioned Sonic movie controversy wasn't that popular like it is today. People weren't as big of complainers back then, as crazy as that may sound. But oh boy did people complain about this movie. The series brought in a decent amount of success, actually. Around 2012 to 2015, I'd say, Ninja Turtles was one of the hottest boy brands around. Me being a part of the Prime demo. But only a couple weeks after the sequel's release, it was confirmed by producers that the series was dead in the water and that there wouldn't be a third installment like everybody expected. Why did this happen? Why did these movies fail? Why wasn't a franchise able to be properly started? Well, we're going to be taking a look back at these Michael Bay Ninja Turtles movies. The history and how these things were made all the way up until their cancellation. This is what went wrong with the Michael Bay Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies. In the late 2000s, Ninja Turtles was doing alright. It wasn't mega popular, but it definitely had a lot of respect and history around it. They're releasing stuff like the TMNT animated movie, as well as the 2003 4 Kids series nearing its end. While the franchise by no means was dying, it was by no means as popular as it was. Peter Laird, the sole owner of the Ninja Turtles at the time after co-creator Kevin Eastman sold a share, long said he would not sell the property unless the price was exactly right, and when Viacom came swooping in with the $60 million offer, he knew what to do. In 2009, Viacom was the new owner of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, with its main home being Nickelodeon. Viacom knew exactly what to do, obviously, producing a brand new TV series, toy line, and being the owners of Paramount Pictures, a new movie series was on the way. Yes, yeah, Paramount Pictures, the same producers of the Transformers movie, so there's only one person to get. Michael Bay! The only possible option to start up this new series. Truly a godsend. But it could have been a lot worse because he was only attached as a producer. So he would not be directing the film, but still to this day, we all call them the Michael Bay Ninja Turtles movies, not the... Jonathan Libsman? I don't know how the heck to say his last name. But the funny thing is, that could have got a lot worse also, because they were gonna get Brett Ratner at one point. The worst director in Hollywood. I'd say we dodged a bullet there, but eh. The film was expected to release sometime in 2012, with production beginning in early 2010, once when Michael Bay was brought on. The thing is, the film went through absolute development hell. It's honestly surprising that this thing got out in 2014, with numerous delays and different dates within 2012, 2013, and then eventually 2014. The film was even presumed dead at one point. That's how bad it was. In 2012, during a Nickelodeon upfront event, Michael Bay spoke on his upcoming Ninja Turtles movie. Multiple clips from that press presentation were leaked where Michael Bay stated that the Ninja Turtles would be from an alien race. When you see this movie, kids are going to believe one day that these turtles actually do exist when we are done with this movie. These turtles are from an alien race and they are going to be tough, edgy, funny, and completely lovable. <laughs> Not just that, but he revealed that the movie would just be called Ninja Turtles, no Teenage Mutant at the front. This caused a lot of backlash, not just from Ninja Turtle fans and pop culture fans. Michael Bay has bastardized Transformers, horror films, hell, even American history. So what made you think he was going to take the Ninja Turtles property and go, you know what, I'm going to do this right, I'm going to stick to canon. But also people who worked on Ninja Turtles, multiple actors, voice actors, even the creators spoke on this. It got to the point where Michael Bay had to release a statement 
Demon, explaining that the title was simply a request of Paramount to make the title shorter and more simple, and that the film is still very faithful to who the Ninja Turtles were and their source material, also stating that April wouldn't be 16 like in the current show, even giving some thoughts on who he'd like to cast, like Ken What's Watanabe as Shredder. But of course, there's a whole other controversy when it comes to Shredder that we'll get onto later on in the video. Alright, jeez Ricardo, this is a lot of controversy and stuff going on in just the pre-production. Surely we're done here, right? No. There is way more. And yes, we're talking about it because it's just that interesting. There was an entire script leaked called The Blue Door that leaked only a couple months after that Nickelodeon upfront presentation. So fans already knew about the direction this film was heading. And this did not help Michael Bay's case. It featured a plethora of major changes. The film followed the turtles who hailed from another dimension that consists of turtle warriors. Splinter is an alien from the same dimension as well. And in this film, Shredder would be Colonel Shredder who is a government agent but is secretly an alien who can grow blades from his body. The foot would be a black ops group, and in this film, Casey Jones was the main protagonist. He'd be an 18-year-old security guard slash amateur hockey ice player that finds the turtles and is the focus of the film. Him and April would be having relationship problems because she'd be moving to New York City for an internship at CBS. Very slick there, Viacom. And the difference with this film is that Raphael would have been the comic relief instead of Michelangelo, and Michelangelo would have fallen in love with a turtle woman from his own planet. What? Once when this got out there, this also drew a statement from Michael Bay again, because yes, there was a lot of backlash to this too, because this was legit. He claimed that this wasn't wrote before he was on the film, even though it's dated long after he joined the film in 2010. So clearly they had a lot of work to do to make this film at least watchable. They brought on a new writer and had to think about how they were going to approach this franchise, because they were changing so much about the source material. And while I don't think anything with this film went normal from here on out. It definitely was a more steady development process than before, but that's not really saying that much. And after a giant marketing campaign in 2014 that included toys and tie-ins with Pizza Hut and Crushed Soda, which he guess his name dropped in the movie, the film officially released on August 8th, 2014. I do want to mention this before we get into the actual movie itself, but the film released in Australia on September 11th, 2014, and they released this poster to promote it in Australia on September 11th. I'll let you take away from that what you will. So now that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with the emphasis on the Ninja Turtles is kind of a middle finger, I'm not gonna lie, that's kind of funny. How did the film turn out? Well, let's take a look. The film opens up with a little bit of the Turtles' backstory being told by Master Splinter. It has this comic book slash graphic novel kind of art style to it, which is a nice touch, I guess, and is a callback to the Turtles' origins, but we'll get back to that later. There's this shot that's way too reminiscent of Fruit Ninja don't know why they needed to do this. The film really starts with April O'Neil being played by Megan Fox. You said to me, You smell like weed. And I said, I am weed. Now more so than not, when people talk about this movie, they bring up that Megan Fox isn't doing a terrible job, and that she's done far worse in other movies like the Transformers films, and other stuff that she's done more recently. But I feel like if this was any other actress, or any other movie, I don't feel it would be cutting her this much slack. Because if we're being real, she's still not that great in this movie. Ninja. Mutant. Turtle. In the beginning of the movie, it's established that April really wants to work on a story, do more with her work, accomplish more than what she's been doing. She's kind of sick of being overly sexualized by Michael Bay, I mean, having to do this kind of stuff on the news, where we're introduced to Vern, who's like the male sidekick slash male protagonist, if you will, played by Will Arnett. And I like Will Arnett, I think he does a great job as Lego Batman, but I do not like him in this movie. And it's not Will's fault, he's not a bad actor, and he's not doing a bad job, it's just that what he he's given isn't good, it's just not a good character. Every time he's on screen, it's like a pissing contest between him and Michelangelo who can make the most cringy, sexualizing, and unfunny jokes. She finds out that there's something sus going on at the docks later that night. By the way, Sky product placement, I remember when that was a thing. And around this part of the movie is when I started to notice that this film has a color grading to it. Yes, it's that time of the review, folks. Technical filmmaking talk. Now let me just state this, I don't think this film is actually shot that bad. The cinematography is actually really good, there's great shot composition, but something that's really distracting and almost takes me out of the entire thing is that the movie, the entire movie, has a really weird green tint to it. I know this is a Ninja Turtles movie, guys, but come on. 
This is stupid. Anyways, while at the dock, she can't take photos because, uh, it's too dark. And this is where we get our first tease at the Turtles. And for whatever reason, they leave their calling card. Turtles, April wouldn't be on your case this hard if you didn't leave this stuff. Now she's been freaking out about it for weeks now. We cut back to the apartment of Megan Fox trying to act, where she's talking with a roommate who's only there to get a slight chuckle out of the audience because, uh, she's normal. Because the Turtles were so stupid to leave the calling card, April now goes to her work to tell Whoopi Goldberg, because why not, about this crazy ninja underground crime stuff that's going on. Now, I understand you want to build April up as crazy and not that important. Ah, uh, that's just April. She jumps on trampolines on the news. But I'm sorry, Whoopi Goldberg and all of her employees are unreasonably mean to her. What are you doing in Brooklyn anyway? Was there a trampoline convention? Like, you can have people who think that she's weird and kind of joke with her, but like, they're bullying her. It just doesn't make sense. It's Megan Fox. Who on God's green earth would bully her? It's Megan Fox, you're fumbling the bag, my brother. After this, we're first introduced to the Shredder. Now, earlier in this video, I did mention that there was a controversy going on around the Shredder. One of the main antagonists, if not the main antagonist of the movie, is Eric Sachs, played by William Fitchner. And in 2013, William Fitchner, who was cast in the movie, spilled that he would be playing the Shredder. Now, what's the issue with this, Ricardo? Well, William Fitchner looks like this, and the Shredder and all other source material looks like this. I mean this. Not only was this a case of whitewashing a character, but it also didn't align with the source material, which fans obviously already had an issue with. But if you look at this clip right here, that isn't William Fitchner. That is because they heard a lot of controversy around this casting, and midway through production, they changed it. And this isn't some conspiracy theory, no, this is confirmed by William Fitchner himself. I think you can see during this entire film's development process, they kept going back and forth on what they wanted and didn't want to do. So that's why Shredder's more of a goon in this movie rather than the actual main protagonist, even if his suit is is absolutely freaking banging. He goes in and out of English and Japanese because children, where he talks about his bad motivation. Eric Sachs is giving a speech where he talks about how him and his company are gonna help New York City, keep it safe, etc. Megan Fox is there, yes, I'm gonna keep calling her Megan Fox, I can't call her April O'Neil, I'm sorry. They talk for approximately, and yes, I timed it, 40 seconds. And then while April and Werner are in the car, she says, Eric Sachs was so inspiring. How is that possible? You talked for under one minute. He told you to keep in there, slugger. April notices that there's some stuff going on in the subway, and she goes to check it out. Even though we had that little tease of the docks, I'd say this is our first proper tease tease of the turtles. There are even some shots where you can see decent looks at them. That cat is playing chopsticks with chopsticks. Why are we still talking about the keyboard cat? And what you'll see is that these guys are absolutely massive. Even though it doesn't scare me because I'm an adult, I can only imagine what a kid might feel watching this. It's kind of scary. <laughs> Don't mess with the camera. Megan Fox looks really scared during this entire sequence, and once everybody's defeated, people go back up to the city. On this completely normal, empty New York street, Megan Fox sees that the turtles are up on a building. Now, this is our actual first proper, proper look at the turtles. I kinda like how they built up the suspense, but I think they kinda honed in too much on Megan Fox for a little too long. It's good to keep us guessing and waiting and leaving us in the dark literally and figuratively, but it took us 21 minutes to actually see them properly. But nonetheless, I still like this reveal. It makes it feel important. It's shot really well, the reveal. The turtles look good. They're animated well. Even if the designs are, well, questionable. Well, I've been putting it off long enough, haven't I? Well, here we go. Well, I'm sure all of you who kept up with this film during its release know the turtles' designs were a major source of controversy. Obviously. This is a major departure from the source material, how they look in literally every other form of media. Not only are they photorealistic, but they are giant, over six feet tall, hulking monsters. I just wanted to clarify, I'm also over six feet tall uh, to any potential uh, female love interests out there. I, I, I didn't want to let that discourage you from having any potential interest in me because I know how some people feel about not being over six feet tall. I just wanted to clarify, I'm also six, I'm six foot two myself, so I just wanted to put that out there. You know, all with battle damaged bandanas, tattoos, pants even, which has really bad implications. Donnie is an entire mess. These aren't the best Ninja Turtle designs. I think keeping them simplistic was the way to go, but this was the kind a movie they wanted to make so this is what they were gonna do and honestly as time went on they kind of grew on me now by no means am i saying these are good designs i think there's way too much stuff going on with them it's like michael bay said how can we cover these guys up with too much junk to where you can barely see them but i don't know i think that they do match each other's personalities pretty well and as the movie goes on i kind of just have to accept it instead of just complaining that it doesn't look like the 1990 movie anyways yes those are designs they're not great but also they're not the worst thing in the world and i can live with them back off raf ma'am hello 
I apologize. My colleague here forgot to say please. Johnny Knoxville sounds so weird to Leonardo. I'm sorry, it's so out of place. It's especially weird because, spoiler alert, in the sequels, he's not played by Johnny Knoxville. He's played by the guy who actually does the mocap work. And guess what? He does a way better job and actually sounds like Leonardo. He doesn't sound like he's 40, but let's not get ahead of ourselves here. That's the second movie. Something I noticed is that they're kind of indecisive in this scene so many times on what they want the tone of these turtles to be. Particularly Raph and Leo, Mikey's being really unfunny the entire time. They're like extra intimidating and don't really feel like heroes. And it's not like that's a plot point that goes on. Learning to inflict your justice the right way. No, they're just scary and their designs don't help that. We obviously know the turtles are good guys because the movie's called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But I don't know, this is out of pocket. If I was April, I'd be freaking the hell out. Do not say a word about this to anyone. If you do, we will find you April O'Neil. <laughs> oh, Mikey, was that you? <laughs> Pepperoni. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! April goes back to her place and freaks the hell out after hearing the name Leonardo because that's what she named one of her pets. And yes, this is where some of the backstory has changed. April's father, who died inside of a lab fire, was experimenting with the four turtles and Splinter. This is shown through April's 4K quality camcorder footage from the 1990s, where she names all of them, gives them their colors. This is a major departure from the source material. April had no connection to the turtles early on. They simply met each other by chance. Not just that, but that's like extremely convenient. The irony of that is crazy. It's cool to branch out and deviate from your source material every now and then. I don't know, I think this one was a mistake. Like I said, it's a little too convenient for the plot. April and her father could have still had a connection to Eric Sachs, but the turtles didn't need to be involved. They simply could have met the way they did in the movie with no prerequisite. Cut to the turtles sneaking back into their sewer, trying to avoid Master Splinter because they're not supposed to be out that late doing what they're doing. And this is honestly where the best part of the movie shines through. The turtles are are the best part of the movie. It's just that we don't get to see them that much. Basically, right when they're introduced, the conflict has already started. There's no time to get to learn these characters and know these characters and actually grow an emotional connection to them. And it's fun when they interact. They have great chemistry for CGI characters, but we'll get to more of that emotional connection later. We get to see abusive father Master Splinter, and then we go back to April, yay. Megan Fox is doing her best to sound and look crazy, but still looking incredibly pretty and well-kept. As she tries to explain to Whoopi Goldberg what's going on, and Whoopi Goldberg is actually trying to listen to her and understand where she's coming from. She sounds genuinely invested for a little bit, but Megan Fox is doing a horrible job at presenting this. She has proof literal, tangible proof, which she doesn't show her. What makes this worse is that when she gets fired, she goes to Eric Sachs' estate to talk to him about this. But what makes this even worse is that she shows him the proof that she should have showed Whoopi Goldberg of the Turtles. Why didn't you just show Whoopi that? Anyways, once Master Splinter is able to get Michelangelo to spill the beans by luring him in with a perfectly hot Pizza Hut pizza, which, how did you get it that hot? You live in a sewer. Their only solution? Kidnap April O'Neil. Find the girl. Bring her here! And remember when I said Megan Fox really wasn't doing the best job? That's yeah, kind of what I'm talking about. She doesn't emote from like this point out. And this is where another issue comes up because Splinter explains the backstory of April and the Turtles. Even though the very beginning of the movie does this just a little more brief. So what's the point of doing that in the beginning if you're just going to explain it later on to keep engagement up? It's movie, it doesn't matter, you got the kids in the seats already. One of the biggest complaints I've seen with this movie is that in this flashback scene, it's explained that Splinter taught himself and the turtles ninjutsu from a book. This is so dumb, right? Yeah, it is. But this is also Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, so I don't care. And right on cue, the foot shows up. Perfect timing. In the middle of the sequence, when everybody's getting their ass cooked, of course we have to have some crushed soda product placement. I got a safe place for you to hide, and if you get thirsty, I got a secret stash of orange crush behind the fridge. There was honestly a really surprisingly good touch that was either really well written or improvised, where Leonardo's trying to talk to Splinter, but instead of calling him Sensei, he switches to Dad at the very end. Sensei! Sensei! Dad! Dad, what are, you, what are you doing? And I think that was a really good touch and was way better than it deserves to be. After everybody but Raph is taken hostage, because Raph is presumed dead by some random foot soldier, Raph must rescue his brothers and leave Splinter to die all by himself. We will drain every last ounce of their blood to get it, even if it kills them. No sh it's gonna kill them, you're taking all their blood. Cut to Vern who's listening to this song. <laughs> 
all alone while making this dry ass sandwich. Everything's wrong with this character. Everything. Eric Sachs, for whatever reason, is explaining his master plan to the turtles like an idiot. In order to reason to get his point across, he uses a test subject. Like, this isn't necessary. They get there, like, really easily. And this is the first time that one of the turtles comes across Shredder properly. The thing is, though, Raph gets his absolute butt kicked, but what I don't get is why he doesn't use any of his brother's weapons. I think that would have been a really cool opportunity. While Raph is about to be killed by Shredder, April asks Donnie what they need to do. He says adrenaline. Adrenaline. And then April goes over to this machine where there's a giant button that says adrenaline. <laughs> Shredder has a tender date he needs to attend to, so he just leaves instead of killing Raph for whatever reason. Now that the turtles have effectively done cocaine for the first time. <laughs> I feel like cleaning. Who wants to clean the dojo? The turtles now need to escape, and Raph is basically perfectly fine. But one of my biggest issues with this version of the turtles is the fact that they're literally bulletproof. It kind of takes away any tension that could potentially be there, because they can literally just do this, and they're completely fine. Enter the semi-truck action sequences, which is one of the heavily marketed aspects of this movie. This is like the most epic thing ever at the time, and it is pretty fun. It's shot really well. They utilize each turtle in a really interesting way. We get a look at Megan Fox's ass. What couldn't you love about this? Don't lie, you look too. There is this shot of like snow texture on Leo's mask that looks really bad here. This looks like a PS2 game. But honestly, other than that, this is a really well done sequence and one of the highlights of the movie. It's just really fun. A lot of this movie can be really boring, so this is kind of a breath of fresh air. Somehow the turtles get back to the city and it's time to take on the Shredder, who's about to release a poisonous gas into the air. If you haven't picked up on it, yes, this is literally the ending to The Amazing Spider-Man. Honestly, the climax of this movie isn't that engaging or fun to watch, mainly because it's so generic. Not only am I not invested in what the villain's about to do, and like I said, Shredder's mainly just a goon, Eric Sachs is the main villain, but like, come on, we know what's about to happen. <laughs> Cowabunga. He said it! He said it! April hits the final blow to Shredder, which a lot of people are upset about, but I honestly don't really care. And the movie tries to give the turtles some character development with a confessions moment, which is a really tired trope at this point. But honestly, this film is filled with a lot of cliches. Anyways, that's kind of where my main issue comes out of this. While I love the turtles and these characters do mean a lot to me because I love them in other media, I don't really feel like I got to know them all that well in this movie. I kind of know their personality because I knew their personality in other media. I didn't really get to see too much in interaction between all of them. When we properly meet them for the first time and they're alone without April, we're kind of already thrown into the plot. We also don't get to see them interact that much between each other when they're alone. All of it centers around April. So yes, well this Raph moment is cool and all, at the same time there wasn't that much tension between him and the others, just a passing mention of him leaving. Anyways, the city is saved, Splinter is saved, and everything is hunky-dory. Michael Bay got its request of one explosion, and the movie ends. Anyways, that was Michael Bay's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 20 2014, and it was alright, I guess. After complaining about this thing for the past, like, what, 15 minutes, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like it's that great. This movie has a lot of problems. The screenplay is bad, the pacing is awful, the characters are incredibly underdeveloped, Megan Fox turns in a very bad performance, and even though people like Whoopi Goldberg, William Finchner, and Will Arnett are trying, I don't really like their characters at all. There's just very little to get me invested in this movie. It seems like it's always going without slowing down and letting me care about these characters, specifically with the turtles like I only said a couple seconds ago. But here's the thing, I actually don't dislike it that much. Yes, there are a lot of issues with it and a lot of things that actually do upset me about it, but at the same time, I see what they were trying to do and I can appreciate that. I do like the cinematography, outside of the green tint. There are a handful of moments with the turtles that are fun and do remind me of those classic characters. I appreciate the tone that they went for even if they're not that dedicated to it, and I am glad that they listened to that early criticism because this could have been a lot worse without that. The film did not do good critically and it was very mixed with fans, but general audiences loved it, making close to 500 million dollars at the box office. So only four days after the film released, a sequel was greenlit. Now remember when we were talking for like 10 minutes about the first film's development? Yeah, we're not gonna be doing that this time around. It's not because I'm cutting corners or anything, it's just because this development went like normal. The main difference this time around is that the film had a new director, Dave Green, opposed to Jonathan Leesman, who supposedly wasn't that great of a dude on the set of the first movie. After briefly being known as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Half Shell, the title was changed to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows, which is actually the name of a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles video game from back in the day. I'm saying back in the day like it was long ago, it was like 2013. Wait, that was 10 years ago, I take that back. Anyways, the film released on June 3rd, 2016. Let's talk about this thing. The film opens on- <gasps> 
Yes, the green tent returns! That's right, guys. This movie has the green tent too. Get used to it. And this time, the movie makes a really good decision opening with the turtles. Yes, we actually get to spend more time with them in this film. It actually feels like a Ninja Turtles film this time around. They're on their way to a next game, which is a really fun opening scene. Even though it's largely CG, I think it's actually shot pretty well. I can't believe I'm saying this about Ninja Turtles movies. Anyways, we get an introduction to each member. That's really weird. This is a little unnecessary. I mean, like, I feel like we all know these characters. I mean, we're watching a sequel, for God's sakes. But they arrive at the next game, enjoy their pizza, and they try to be as loud as possible. Are you guys trying to get caught? Here you get a real good look at the turtles, and this is where you get a look at the fact that the turtles are a little less detailed this time around. By no means do they look bad. Well, I mean, you know. What I'm saying is, if it doesn't look off, it doesn't look bad. But there is far less detail this time around because the turtles need more screen time. Not just that, but like I mentioned earlier, the turnaround for this film was pretty fast. Here we get reintroduced to everyone's favorite character, Vern. Oh god, they know what he got on these many magazines. One Got Next, we get reintroduced to April, but not just that, she's infiltrating Baxter Stockman, a famous Ninja Turtles villain from the comic books and TV series, who's played by none other than Tyler Perry. Comic Con, yeah. <laughs> Michael Bay, you make really bad movies and you're kind of a creep, but I gotta thank you for this. April gets all the information off of Baxter's iPad, as the Turtles are still at their next game, where one of the goofiest forms of product placement happens. <laughs> I have not met anybody who calls their shoe a Nike. Nobody talks like that. April discovers that Baxter Stockman's planning on breaking Shredder out of jail, who, by the way, is played by a completely new actor. And it's not even subtle. Here's a side by side of the actor from the first movie and the second. Yeah, they couldn't have picked anybody different. The only similarities, maybe, is the fact that there's scars and he's Asian, but the scars aren't even consistent from the first movie, so I guess he's just Asian. He has his mask off for basically the entire movie, so I guess they wanted someone more conventionally attractive? I don't know, I think this casting decision was kind of weird. This is also where we're introduced to a bunch of new characters back to back to back. Not only are we introduced to Bebop and Rocksteady, but we're also introduced to Casey Jones. And these two couldn't be any more different from each other. I think Bebop and Rocksteady are honestly one of my favorite parts of the movie, and Casey Jones is one of my least favorite. I'm not one of those people who say that you need to stick to the source material, but like, they kinda should have stuck to the source material. It's not just that he's a cop, but Stephen Amell is not doing a really good job. I don't think Stephen Amell's a bad actor by any means. Now, I'm not gay. But I would let Stephen Amell ravage my asshole like a starving tiger. But during the entire movie, he has this shit-eating grin on his face the entire time. It's like he knows what he's filming is dumb. I just can't take the dude seriously, who I'm supposed to at some points. I just can't. That's Officer Jones. And I'm gonna be a detective someday. What are you, five? In the beginning of the movie, he's really just there to fill up the cuss word quota of the day. Hot damn! Son of a bitch! What the hell is this? The turtles now are on the move to go stop this breakout. And we get a look at the turtle van that's actually practical and looks really cool. It's obviously different from the one in the first movie, but I think it was a good change. There's so many little details inside of it and it looks really fun and like I'd like to hang out in here. It being practical just helps so much. They could have just made the CGI, which I appreciate that they didn't do. So Conor McGregor and Kodak Black back here. <laughs> are chattering up with Shredder, talking about how much they love him. But before any meaningful conversation can happen between the three, which I'm sure would have happened, breakup begins. Honestly, this car chase is really fun. It's all practical, I believe. Sorry I'm talking about practicality so much, but I think it's really important in filmmaking. Shredder escapes, but he's teleported to Krang, a famous Ninja Turtle villain. And I swear to God, this is the most boring part of the movie. He's literally just dumping exposition non-stop to where I can't get invested in him as a villain or a character, because he literally just gives him video game like objectives to go collect these three things to come build a portal once again this is dumb, but it's Ninja Turtles, so I kinda have to accept that. This is the part of the movie where I think everybody realizes that it's taking itself way less seriously than the first. It's far more campy. Which honestly, I don't know how to feel about. And it's very much so trying to be like the 1980s cartoon, but my favorite interpretations of the Ninja Turtles is like the 1990 movie and the 2003 series. Stuff like that that has its fun, but it takes itself way more seriously. I kinda like that that's what they were going for with the first movie. This definitely feels like a Nickelodeon movie. Which isn't a bad thing, 
interesting, but still, it's a very big tonal shift from the first. Shredder recruits Bebop and Rock City to become his goons slash test subjects. He meets up with Baxter Stockman, who uses the ooze to turn them into giant rhinoceros and warthog. Let me look, I'm a... Oh. I'm a little piggy. April was infiltrating all of this, which was really dumb, and she manages to escape with a vial of ooze. But the foot eventually catches up with her, but don't worry, Casey Jones is there, just as intimidating as ever. Man, this guy is so cool. Fun fact, this is the only time Casey Jones wears his iconic mask in the entire movie. And they all meet up with the turtles and this mother can't stop smiling! Donnie experiments with the ooze and discovers that the ooze can actually turn them human. He goes to tell Leo about this, but Leo warns them not to tell anybody. Fortunately, Mikey overhears this, and this is where the main conflict starts up. The movie being titled Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows, a lot of the emphasis of the movie is them being in the shadows and kind of wanting to escape that. They are outcasts, they are weirdos. I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. I don't fit in, and I don't Wanna fit in. And that's a big part of the movie. So once when Mikey tells Raph about this, him and Leo get into a big fight. I actually like this fight, there was no action that needed to be happening, just them talking and arguing. I honestly think it's really well done. And what about Mikey? He don't get a vote? There's only one vote that counts in this family. Mine. I don't think Leo was supposed to be likable in this movie. The team is effectively split up for like a little bit when Leo and Donnie go to infiltrate this museum where Shredder just was to pick up one of the pieces to his portal, while Raph and Mikey break into the police department to pick up that canister of ooze so they can become human. But the foot already have it, and this is where all four come together again. They all get caught by the police, being the first time that human beings other than April and Casey are actually seeing them for the first time. Of course the police wouldn't shoot them, and they managed to escape. There's a little bit of time where they're able to talk with Splinter about how they feel and what just happened, but literally it stops immediately because this film's pacing is absolutely bonkers. It can't stop moving. There's no time to slow down. They find out that Bebop and Rocksteady are in Brazil, and there's only one thing for them to do go to Brazil. I will say, it's kind of fun to see the Ninja Turtles out of New York for a little bit, and a really cool fight scene with Bebop and Rocksteady occurs. It's honestly a highlight of the movie in my opinion, but it does have a little bit of a sour taste in my mouth because it did break the dramatic tension of what was going on. Anyways, Bebop and Rocksteady manage to get off at the last piece, and Leo continues to be an absolute asshat. Thanks guys. Real team effort. The portal opens and it's time for the final battle. The Technodrome comes through along with Krang as they contemplate whether they should turn into humans. Leo leaves up to Raph, but he says no. I'm gonna be honest, it would have been kinda cool to see what they looked like as humans. I know a lot of people think that sounds really dumb, but I don't know, it's something we've seen in the movies before. The police are waiting for them as they exit, and I guess everything's chill, as Vernon confesses that he wasn't the one who actually defeated Shredder. Everybody splits up. The white people go off to fight Bebop and Rocksteady, and the Ninja Turtles go off to fight Krang. Why the hell is Karai standing like that, you goofball? The Turtles fight Krang on the Technodrome, yada yada yada, big bombastic action sequence over. I'll be back, Turtles! A thousand times stronger! That didn't age well. The Turtles are congratulated with the key to the city, where all of their character development comes to fruition. Which I actually feel this one does better than the first when it comes to that. It feels more earned when there was like an actual central theme around this one. God, Steven and Mel's too strong. If Megan Fox look at me like this, I'd let out a soft moan and fall to my knees. The turtles celebrate on top of the Statue of Liberty, and the movie ends. And so did the franchise too. Even though this one did perform better critically, it's like comparing a piece of sh to a piece of shit with sprinkles. Not just that, but the film did not do good at the box office. Only racking in around 250 million, opposed to the close to 500 million the first one made. That's effectively slicing it in half. After this, the franchise died only a couple weeks when producers said that a sequel was very unlikely. But the thing is, this did much better with fans, sticking closer to the source material, making changes that even messed with the first movie. It was almost everything Ninja Turtles fans were asking for, I just think that they would have liked if the designs were different, but in terms of the story, this is very Ninja Turtles. Like I said, the tone very much so deviates from the first, which was both a good and bad thing. On one hand, you're more faithful to the source material, which makes fans happier, but on the other hand, you're being incredibly inconsistent, messing with what the first movie set up. But not just that, a lot of continuity errors, recasts, what could have allowed for more cohesion, I feel. I don't know, even though I would say this one is technically a little bit better, there are a lot of aspects of the first movie 
movie I do enjoy more. The issue with this though is that Ninja Turtles was kinda slowly dying out a little bit. By no means would I say Ninja Turtles are now unpopular or incredibly niche, but I think there was a little bit of fatigue honestly, and a lot of the kids who grew up with the first movie were getting a little bit older, including me. As opposed to being in elementary school, like when the first movie came out, I was going into my final year of middle school. I just wasn't that into Ninja Turtles anymore. And I feel like that was a lot of kids my age. Not only do I think that the Ninja Turtles fan base is by no means large enough to carry this franchise itself, when it was incredibly popular with people who weren't necessarily a part of the fan base and was just a really cool franchise that a lot of kids liked on Nickelodeon, Nickelodeon knew that and they pumped so much stuff out in relation to it. The TV show, toys galore, merchandise everywhere, and then you only had a one year break between the TV show premiere and the actual movie. That movie was incredibly popular and then the show kept running, and you're gonna eventually run out of steam because you're doing too much with Ninja Turtles. It's so much at once. And even though the movie was popular, maybe some people didn't like the direction that the movie took. It was very dark, it was very different. I'm sure some parents didn't like that, and you never know, maybe some kids didn't either. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if kids didn't like the look of this. I'd say it's a mixture of things why this movie series burned out. And yes, while I'm sure some people would go to the designs and that those threw everybody away, people saw those before the first movie came out, and then people went to go see the first movie and it made like a bunch of money. So while yes, those aren't great, that's not really the reason why they failed. I think it was a mix of fan fatigue, kids getting older, and also, once again, the critical reception to this still wasn't that great. It has like a 38 on Rotten Tomatoes. Ninja Turtles is just one of those properties. It has waves to it. It has very high highs and it has very low lows. The first movie was a part of a very high high, and the second one, unfortunately, was the trajectory to a very low low. There's not really that much going on with the franchise right now. After Out of the Shadows, a new TV show followed, but was cancelled after only two seasons because nobody watched it, even though it does have a very large following. Currently, there is no Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles show on the air right now, and the franchise is kind of dormant, only releasing comic books and merchandise. But it's not like things are incredibly bleak and there's nothing to look forward to because there are actually two movies in production right now. One is only a year away, called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles The Next Chapter, which is actually produced by Seth Rogen. That's an animated film, so I guess you can compare that to the TMNT movie from 2007. And there's also a live action reboot in the works from Colin Jost and his brother. Now that one's a little interesting, because not only is it also live action, but Michael Bay is still attached to it. It's basically the same team working on it, minus the writers, and I'm sure there'll be a new director. I'm not really sure what's in store for either of these movies, but I'm looking forward to it. It was really fun being a part of that Ninja Turtles craze in the early 2010s, and I'm sure we'll all never experience anything like that again because, well, I was a kid. There's something special about these characters in this franchise. It's just really fun. It's a real shame that these movies didn't pan out. It's almost like it was doomed from the very start. Viacom gets a new hot property and they want to do everything with it that they possibly can. They just kind of got the wrong people in charge. But at the same time, whatever these characters do next, you can bet I'll be there. I was wondering, maybe, could I make you my baby?